I'm using a really crappy I'm using a really crappy webcam it's the only one I can find my other one's not working for some reason operating the way it is okay so anyway on to first Timothy we'll see if I can do anything with that today first Timothy is a book not for new believers and it is not a book first and second Timothy and Titus are not books that you should go to when you're just when you got questions about assurance of salvation and how do I get the guilties off and how do I know that when I sinned that time that wasn't the end of my relationship with God if you got questions like that you need to be in Romans and Galatians and then Ephesians and Colossians first and first Timothy second Timothy and Titus are pastoral they're not even just pastoral letters they are warfare strategy books for spiritual warfare for ministers who know who they are and where they are and what they're doing okay now most of us don't operate from a base of even knowing who we are or what we're doing <laughs> we're just trying to figure out if we're going to be in the lake of fire or not so that's not really who these are directed to these are for people who know the mystery of Christ and take it for granted they understand that you know Timothy is not afraid he's gonna lose his salvation Timothy is in Ephesus and he's there by choice he didn't have to go but he did go and he got discouraged in the midst of it and now he would not be discouraged if he didn't have a vision and know why he was supposed to be there he was discouraged because he knew exactly why he was supposed to be there and he was feeling so ineffective and he was so overwhelmed by the futility of his situation not because bad things were happening to him and his life fell and he wasn't even thinking like that he was looking at the church and the deviation from the truth and the apostasy and trying to speak into that and meeting nothing but resistance from people who would no longer tolerate the truth and so Paul's writing to him seems a lot stricter than Paul's writing in say Corinthians you know or Romans of course why because he's not trying to assure Timothy that he's saved he's charging him to get back up and run the race and put his armor back on or to at least recognize that there's a need for armor he knew there was a need for armor but when Paul talks to him about okay you need to run the race to get the prize and you need to put you know go go to war with your armor on he's speaking like that because he's letting him know yeah this is not a walk in the park that you you it was a, it, a by way of encouragement to identify that the situation is as tough as what he thinks it is you know Paul even said all the churches in Asia departed from me and at my defense nobody stood with me and everybody left and I was all alone why did he tell Timothy that that's not encouraging well if you're in Timothy's situation and you think your ministry is a failure and Paul's telling you look all the churches I raised up have departed from my ministry and yet I know I run my race then it's it's an encouragement okay so that's the first thing is when you read this book first and second timothy you should not be thinking what is this saying about my christian life and what is this saying about my salvation that's a really big mistake that people read this book and try to figure out things about their salvation or their christian life in it because it's not about that and any pastor that has ever taught you from this book to try to try to put guilt on you about your christian life has no idea what he's talking about so that's the first thing second thing is that yes this is strategic and it is about ministry and it's about how to conduct yourself as a minister and what ministry is in the context of spiritual warfare okay so this is written to timothy who's in ephesus and and what letter do we have from paul to ephesus well we have ephesians and Ephesians has the vision of God's heart to build up the body of Christ and also the fact that this is because it's central to God's heart and purpose it is attacked and so there's the corporate warrior in Ephesians 6 but really everything in Ephesians 4 through 6 is all spiritual warfare and we talked about this when we went through Ephesians last time but there are babes being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine 
this is an attack on the body of Christ. And it is not from personal strife and people that don't like me. You know, it has nothing to do with that. It is a matter of the principalities and the rulers of darkness in high places are attacking the body of Christ. They do not want the body of Christ to be built up and they do not want the fellowship to be realized and Christ to be manifested in the church. So there's God's building on the one hand and he gives apostle, evangelist, shepherd, prophet, teacher for the equipping of the saints under the work of the ministry unto the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith, the full knowledge of the Son of God, the perfect man, the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ, that we no longer be babes tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that is comes by men who are crafty and laying in wait to deceive with a view into building up a system of error. So they are building too. And there's a building up of a system of error, and that's what the institutional church system is today. And there's the building up of the body of Christ, which happens as people grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ out of babyishness and being tossed by winds of doctrine, they are fed and nourished by the gifted evangelist, apostle, prophet, shepherd, and teacher who are given for the equipping of the saints through the apostolic ministry. They're growing in the knowledge of Christ and being built up in love so that they're no longer tossed by these winds of doctrine. That's the warfare. That's the practical strategy of the warfare. Then, the, be, those people who are no longer babes are told to walk worthily of their calling and to not be like the Gentiles who, who, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, just going after their feelings. But they're to put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him, right? And they, this putting on of the new man is in the context of fellowship, with the body of Christ in all these relationships, mothers and, and fathers and children and co-workers and bosses and employees and church members, and in the midst of all of that, and husbands and wives, in the midst of all that, there is supposed to be a building up of the body of Christ going on where you are not walking just according to your natural feelings, having your understanding darkened, where you don't know why you're here or what you're doing anymore which is the condition of a babe who is just trying to figure out if he's going in the lake of fire or not and that's why he's tossed from every wind of doctrine because he's so gripped by fear and he hasn't grown in the knowledge of christ once we grow in the knowledge of christ and we gain a vision of what we're doing and why we're here we can walk worldly of this calling right and this calling is unto the building up of the body of Christ, and we start to look at our relationships, should be looking at our relationships and our time on earth differently. When someone says something to you that insults you, you don't just go immediately to your feelings and how unfair that was, especially they're a member of the body of Christ, and then respond from your flesh and make it worse. You know, Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath in chapter four, right? After talking about the building of the body of Christ and putting on the new man and not being in the futility of your mind, you know, like the Gentiles, he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give place to the enemy, the devil, right? Don't give place to the devil. The devil is attacking in the relationships and he does it in two ways. First, he gets you off of the reason we're here keeps you ignorant of the building up of the body of Christ. And then in your ignorance, you don't interpret anything that happens with any kind of spiritual knowledge at all. You just react out of your feelings and do this and that. Now what's pathetic is when YouTube channels and ministries who are supposedly the ones who have a real vision around here, right? That they act like that, you know, and I've seen a bunch of instances in the last four years <laughs> and recently of people having absolutely no sense of strategy with their channels, even if they do like the teaching and try to teach grace, everything is flesh and everything is I'm insulted. And that person said something about me and that made me look bad. And I'm worried about what that did to me. And it is all 
darkened understandings and futility of the mind. No consciousness of the building up of the body of Christ. No consciousness of, hey, we are under attack here. No, nope, it's I'm going to expose that person and that person said this and that, you know. I, uh, now, there is a time to, to be marking, avoiding false teachers and calling them out. And we do all that. I'm talking about in the camp when everybody's on the same team, supposedly, and everyone's clueless. And they're just doing their own thing. No coordination. No sensitivity. Everybody's on their own. Every man for themselves. You know. And I'm not for building any kind of institutional church or official affiliation or anything like that. But I see people interpreting everything in the light of self and not in the context of the building up of the body of Christ and not perceiving anything related to how does this affect us strategically what is the enemy attacking here you know yeah he attacked that channel and yeah that guy wasn't clear and yeah this happened and that happened but what's at stake what what truth is about to be lost if i respond this way what does that do to this whole community's perception of that teaching you know there's no there there's not a lot of sensitivity to that and that is what timothy is about Timothy is about how do you maintain vision in the midst of apostasy and have a sense of commission and actually have a purpose and be working towards it. I mean, are you just reacting to things that happen on YouTube? I saw this teaching, so I did this, and I saw one of those, so I'm going to do a teaching about this, with no sense of line upon line precept upon precept i'm building something here i know where god's going i know what we're i know what's been revealed so far i know where we're standing and i know what's yet to be spoken how am i going to get there how are we going to get there you know i really pray that the lord does keep working and building and equipping us and teaching us so that we actually function as the body of christ and this is not a religious talk about how we're supposed to all be so loving to each other. You know, oh, if you're really the body of Christ and blah, blah. No, I'm not talking about that. You know, hirelings who call on you to walk in love towards wolves, they don't have any vision either. They are looking for a wage, okay? And they're just trying to win treats and favor and flattery. That That's all their wage. And they're just going from dopamine hit to dopamine hit, you know? The question is, why are you here? And are you here because God put you here? And are you conscious of that? Or do you just get offended and run every time something happens? And, all, you know, you're, you're surprised anytime anyone says anything bad about you or you won't put your neck out because you're not going to fight, you know. And all of us are tempted to do that, to back off from the truth, to not push forward, or to just be completely reactive Meaning, I'm not here commissioned to do anything. I'm just, I click on my feed and I and I just respond to this and I respond to that and I respond to this. You know, maybe some, what people are saying is edifying is coming out. Okay. But what motivates you is wins. There's nothing, there's no fixed, okay, <laughs> I can see that this community is now able to see where you know three years ago they were only able to see christ as our righteousness and it was an uphill battle to say that christ is our sanctification now we are at the point where we can talk about the reward being a matter of inheritance and talk about the everlasting covenant and people actually understanding it whereas if i spoke that three years ago there's no way it's not like i didn't i wasn't wanting to speak on those things three years ago there was just no way how do i know when to when to push forward in a in like a new layer you know it or is there a new layer i guess the point i'm making is why are we here you know what are you doing <laughs> and that's what timothy to me is really about and who it's for it is not you know going through timothy shouldn't just be another thing where we're untwisting the passages that all the pastors use to try to show that they're wrong again you know no Timothy is a admonition to a minister 
to stay on track. But it defines a lot of good things for us that we can see. And, and it'll help everybody, you know, because the way pastors do use these verses often, and the way religion uses them is to scare people and make them think they're losing their salvation. So not, I don't want to say that that element isn't going to be in here. And if you're looking for comfort, for assurance, you're not going to find it in these teachings, no. But the, that's not the focus of Timothy. And it's one of the things we should keep in mind when we read it, because... Again, if you're looking for assurance, your assurance comes from the doctrine of Christ. These books take the doctrine of Christ for granted. There's nothing in Timothy that talks really about our need to see that we died to the law and died to the elements of this world and do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, don't govern us anymore. We need to set our mind on things above. And it's really not like that because it's understood that you already take this for granted. This is Paul's son in the faith meaning he raised him deep in the doctrine of Christ, the mystery of Christ. Now, he's writing to Timothy, who he put in Ephesus, and, and just to give you a little background on Ephesus, so if you go to Acts, remember what Paul said when he was on the way to Jerusalem in Acts 20. He knew that the end of his ministry was at hand. He knew the whole thing in Jerusalem was a trap, that he was going to end up being delivered over to the Gentiles, and bonds and afflictions awaited him. And yet he was pressed in the spirit to go because he knew that's his path to Rome. But he said when the last time he met with the elders there and Ephesus was sort of his church at, that he kind of raised up as a center. But he said when they were come to him, he said, you know, from the first day I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you in all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with tears and temptations which be felt upon me by the lying in wait of the Jews and how I kept back nothing that was profitable to you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both the Jews and Greeks, repentance towards God, faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will befall me, say that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions wait me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I can finish my course with joy." and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Therefore take record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel, all the counsel of God. Take heed to yourselves and to the flock over which... Uh, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, and of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, and you know yourselves that I ministered with my hands and my needs and to them that were with me. I've showed you these things, how laboring you ought to support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus is more given, uh, blessed to give than receive. Then he, nailed and, he knelt and prayed with them all, and they all wept. Man, and fell on his neck and kissed him, sorrowing for all the words that he spoke, that they would see him no more. That's so heavy. But he said, wolves even among you, even among the people that were there. And I believe he had a sense of who was going to be a problem, because I know I always do. And you can't call them out. You have to wait for it to manifest, because when they're so embedded in the community and everybody's listening to them, you can't just go, you know, hey, that person over there. Until the Lord says it's time and manifests it and they manifest their folly and they manifest their error and, and usually that happens when they attack you. You have to wait. <laughs> and sometimes it's months before they reveal themselves, you know. But anyway, the point is his warning to them sets the stage. Now, when he was in prison, he was imprisoned right after that. He went to Jerusalem. The riot broke out. He was in prison, taken to Rome. Eventually, he wrote Philippians and Ephesians, Colossians. But Ephesians has the book that opens up the vision of God's heart. Ephesians is a special church, meaning made of choice. 
And if you think about the attention Ephesian Ephesus got, not only did Paul write to them, and not only did he send Timothy, and so there's first and second Timothy, but then John wrote the letters to the churches in Revelation 30 years later, starting with the letter to the church at Ephesus. And what you see in my Revelation playlist I covered on this, that why Asia? Asia was totally attacked. It was a place of spiritual warfare, starting with Ephesus. They had the most resistance from all kinds of demonic forces, I guess, principalities, against Paul's ministry specifically. And he said in Timothy, 2 Timothy, that all the churches had in Asia specifically had departed from him. And it was Jews in Asia that stirred up the riot in the temple, actually. Jews from Asia, sorry. I'm still very tired. I'm, I'm about 60% better. Maybe 80. But, so, Asia's a place... You know, there was one time when Paul wanted to go into Asia and God forbade him, didn't let him go. There was a timing to it because of the warfare there and the timing of the, there's a Jezebel spirit there that's really strong. <laughs> Satan's throne, Diana, all that stuff, right? There's the principalities arrayed against them. And so he gives them vision. Then John writes the letters. Then when he gets out of Patmos, where does he go? John goes to Ephesus and writes the Gospel of John and first through third John. Or most of those letters are associated with that church. So think about how much attention Ephesus got from the Lord. She's called the Maiden of Choice. By the time Paul writes to Timothy, though, <coughs> think about it. Here, it's only a couple of years, but apparently all those wolves that he warned about are now overrunning the church in Ephesus. And Timothy is there, right? I won't be able to go much further. My voice won't handle it, but <clears throat> I just want to read a little bit of this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, he's writing this to, think about this. If you were to receive a letter from someone who says, I'm your father in the faith of the Lord, they were very close. But the formality and the, and the sternness by which Paul approaches him, I think really spells out, I don't want you to see me according to the flesh. You know, Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. I don't think it's God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thinking he's saying God, our Savior, and God, our Lord Jesus Christ, which is so cool. You know, Jesus Christ is God, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Jesus Christ, our Lord. As I besought you, to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables, endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying. Now that word godly edifying there is oikonomia, where we get dispensation or God's economy. So neither give heed to fables and endless gene genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith since i since i besought you to abide there so do that's what he's saying you're supposed to be there charging people not to teach other doctrine that's why i left you there remember this is spiritual warfare other doctrine is a matter of spiritual warfare it's not just well i don't want them teaching that and this and that that, that stuff's stupid this is the good stuff no this is all a matter of spiritual warfare now the end of the commandment is uh, or the charge is charity or love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned okay the ministry genuine new testament ministry will produce love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a good conscience doesn't mean i dotted all the p's and q's and i kept the law good conscience means i know how to stand before the lord having my conscience purged from dead works from an unfeigned faith, sincerely standing before him in grace, knowing I'm justified, and seeing him, and that purifies my heart, and there's a love that flows out of that. That is not phony. It's not because of a command. Okay? It's the end of a it's an end of an administration. There's an administration that actually ministers this, and we'll have to look into this. Because you can't understand first Timothy one four and five without understanding what God's oikonomy is, his economy, 
And we get that from Ephesians 3, where Paul defines the terms of his ministry. What is ministry? We have to look in that. Because if you don't know what ministry is, then you won't even understand how to interpret any of this. But one thing he does say is, look, don't let them teach other doctrine or give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Now, at that time, I've taught on this before, but the fables <clears throat> were things like the Book of Jasher and superhero lore about the early church father, not the early church father, the, the patriarchs. You know, the Book of Jasher has Jacob's sons all doing these feats of strength as if they're the judges in the book of judges and they're doing all these supernatural things and defeating whole cities and 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 the other thing is endless genealogies well who belongs to what tribe and who's really human because the book of enoch was apparently a big deal and there was a big thing about nephilim <laughs> imagine that nephilim and apocalyptic lore based on fables, okay, which is a half-truth mixed with moral story. You know, it's designed to make a, mor a moral point, usually, and yet it's not true. I mean, it's got some truth and it's not true, but when you add it to the endless genealogies, it, he says it ministers questions or produces speculation. So what it is, it is ends up in little groups of people that go around chasing Nephilim, speculating about the day of the Lord, speculating this is going to happen and speculating that's going to happen. And, and it's all just speculation and there's not an ounce of edification in it. Somebody came on my channel the other day saying, I know why you have a problem with Genesis, which I don't. <laughs> it's because you can't handle the fact that the earth is flat and you don't realize that Darwin was a Jesuit and those, you know, those institutional brainwash centers you call schools have got your mind all you know I, and it was just a, a big tirade because i didn't use genesis to try to disprove that the earth is round instead i used genesis to see what is god's testimony concerning christ he looked at that as me having a problem with genesis why because he's blinded by ideology and his whole even his channel name he had a you know, it shows the name of the channel, the person who's commenting. It, it was about Flat Earth. He, he's all caught up in fables and endless genealogies. None of that stuff he can prove, you know, one way or another. Now, that'll offend people. If you're offended by me saying that, and you can't give me some latitude and say, well, I don't agree, but it's a secondary issue, you're going to flip out and unsubscribe. Because while I was talking about Timothy, I mentioned that this flat earth stuff that you're all tied up in may be fables and endless genealogies because you're all wrapped up in who's the Jesuits and who's the 12 blood, 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati and which one's the Antichrist coming out of and which one's a Nephilim and all that stuff has nothing to do with the faith and it definitely doesn't produce edification or God's economy and it doesn't issue out of uh, in love out of a pure heart. <coughs> this guy was talking to me in such a condescending dripping tone it was it was so gross and satanic the tone he had of just like he i must be an evolutionist and i must have problems with genesis and i and i'm clearly brainwashed and I mean, it, was, it was just ridiculous it had nothing to do with anything i taught and that's the smug arrogance of someone who is caught up in bible bible geek stuff but has no vision and no view of God's economy and doesn't minister. He's not interested in ministering. He's walking in the futility of his mind and his heart is darkened. He, he may be a believer. I'm sure he is. But he's all caught up in all this stuff, which Paul's way of dealing with that stuff. See, we look at these epistles and we see his instructions and we think, well, he's telling people not to charge, to charge that they don't teach other doctrine, you know, don't go after these things. That's the root. But the fruit was that the entire church life was completely overthrown and out of control. Whole households were overthrown and everything was a mess. <coughs> but the root is winds of doctrine. And behind that is the enemy's attack, you know, to, and it's always to break down the fellowship and get people off on a tangent. If you're not focused on Christ, you're starving. And if you're not growing in the knowledge of Christ, you're being tossed by winds of doctrine. There's no in between. 
And if you're being tossed, then you're going to be emotional and drunk. You know, a drunk person falls all over, gets easily offended, yells at people, can't control his emotions. You can't, you can be around them. So what the enemy likes to do is get everybody drunk on sensationalism and idolatry and through false doctrines, winds of doctrine, to make sure that no one is th even thinking about the fellowship or the building up of the body of Christ, you know? So he says the end of the commandment. So, so in contrast to the fables and endless genealogies, which produce speculation rather than God's economy, which we'll look at in the next message when I get my voice back, which is in faith. He says, I've, I've charged you that you would show people that they would teach no other doctrine. Now that was such a high, high, high thing for Timothy because he was young and he was stigmatized for being associated with Paul who was in prison for an e as an evildoer, right? Anyway, now the end of the commandment is charity, love out of a pure heart, good conscience, faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved aside, from what? From, from God's economy, actually, have turned aside to vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. Now, usually when behind the speculation and the genealogies and the fables, there's always ordinances, you know, the, that stuff was tampered with Nephilim DNA, and that's why if you take that thing, your DNA is going to be changed, and now you're not eligible for salvation. You've just taken the mark of the beast. It, it always comes down to do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. It's ordinances. And when we went through Colossians, we saw really clearly that ordinances are the way that the principalities rule over our conscience and keep us in darkness <coughs> and fear. Anyway, and, and, and it's always an attack on the assurance of babes. It's babes in Christ who suffer because they're the ones who are tossed by the winds of doctrine. The ones who, sh who claim to be more mature are the ones who peddle it. And they look up to these people because they think they're teachers. And a lot of times these teachers will teach them a little bit of the milk of the word and then give them a bunch of garbage and backload it with all kinds of ordinances. That's mostly what YouTube is. <laughs> Desiring to be teachers of the law. Okay, these people who've turned aside from God's economy unto vain jangling. Why? Because they desire to be teachers of the law. Understanding neither what they say or what they affirm, but we know that the law is good if man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, murderers and fathers, mothers, murderers and mothers, for manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers or liars, perjured persons, if there be anything other that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. Most people read that as if the gospel is another law. The gospel says don't be a whoremonger. The gospel says don't be lawless because this stuff is contrary to the doctrine of Christ. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is all those things belong to the flesh and the law was here. See, it's, it's understood that you, it's taken for granted that the reader, Timothy, knows the doctrine of Christ, and knows the function of the law. So he knows that the law was given as a ministry of condemnation and death to condemn the flesh and get you to agree that it needs to be crucified and is good for nothing other than the cross. Okay, So the gospel, though, reveals the righteousness of God from faith to faith, and it is a righteousness that's revealed apart from the law. Remember what it says in Romans 3, that Christ is the manifestation of God's righteousness, though witnessed by the law, and the prophets, though manifested apart from the law. Christ's righteousness is much higher than the law. And he is the righteousness of God manifested on and in believers as they walk by faith in the gospel. That's not spelled out in Timothy, but we get it from Romans. And again, you know, First Timothy takes it for granted that you understand this doctrine. <clears throat> so when he says that the law is not for the righteous, but for all these things, and then for the people who do these things, and then he says these things are contrary to the doctrine of Christ, sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, he's not saying that the gospel is another law against all these things. What he's saying is that the gospel reveals the Christ as the righteousness of God upon those who believe, and the power to deal with any of that stuff is in the gospel, which is... I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. The life I now live by the f in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That becomes our life. Timothy, that was already a given for him. <clears throat> we have to spell that out. So in the next message, I'm going to talk about what is God's economy, 
And because God's economy is how Christ becomes our life. Oikonomi, Mary said, I, I charged you to teach, I, I, I'm sorry, I left you in Ephesus when I went to Macedonia that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine other than godly edifying, which is God's economy, oikonomia, which is in faith. So there's all these other things, and then there's God's economy. God's economy, his administration, his dispensation, is the only way that the body of Christ is built up and people can live Christ. And living Christ is the only answer to all these horrible things that the law is against. So when he says that all these things are contrary to the sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, when it's because the gospel reveals God's economy and is according to God's economy, which is his, his administration, which is how he works it out so that people can actually live Christ. So they don't do all those things, okay? The gospel has the power, but it doesn't need to mention all those things. The gospel, just by telling you who Christ is, takes care of all those things. Puts him in the rearview mirror, under the water, so to speak, because we're buried with him in baptism into his death. So we'll talk about that. This didn't go as I thought. I knew I needed to teach. I needed to at least give an intro again, but I wasn't sure what I was going to say and how long I'd be able to speak <laughs> because my voice is not doing so good. All right. Talk to you later.